and her colleagues have been involved in lap lung disease and, and, and in particular she has been actively involved in community exercises and educational activities related to the disease and welcome Dr. Zavi and you can take on. I'm Sue Jardy, and um, I have, I'm in the College of Pharmacy, a professor over at UHU in the College of Pharmacy. And um, I started working on rat lungworm, uh, yeah. I started working on rat lungworm maybe uh, around 2011. Uh, I had heard about rat lungworm disease. How many of you have a, heard, prior to today heard, heard about rat lungworm disease? Some of us. <laughs> So Rob Cowley invited me over to uh, what was then the second annual International Rat Longworm Disease uh, Working Group. And people from all over the world came and, and it was a very nice uh, presentation and, and I learned a lot uh, during that meeting. And I also met a lady named Kay Howe. And Kay Howe's son Graham was seriously infected in 2008. He nearly died. He was in a coma for three months. And she basically quit her job as a teacher, moved into the hospital, and now he is 30, and he's, he's doing okay. He still has uh, issues, um, but he's doing okay. And then Kay decided to go back to school. Now she's a graduate student working in my lab and working on various aspects of rat lung disease. Um, Robert is my lab manager. He's also a first year pharmacy student, and Michael is an undergraduate. And we've all been working. Uh, this, this, these studies uh, were done um, summer. And so this is this is the deal. Uh, it involves, it's really pretty disgusting, it involves rats, it involves all sorts of moths, slugs and snails, and even rat poop. Um, so you're familiar with the catchment system. And um, this is a, an adult uh, female rat lungworm. They're actually quite pretty when you're looking at them. Um, and these are adults, um, so to give you a perspective of the size. And I know you can't, it's hard to see this. This is a, a larva of an LP species, probably. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about these uh, uh, pilot studies that we did this past summer, looking at the potential for rainwater catchment as a source for infection, human infection, and, and other animal infection um, due to uh, angiostrongulus candensis, which is the uh, positive organism of rat lungworm disease. And so, uh, rat lungworm disease, uh, the organism Angiostrongylus cantonensis was actually first described in 1935 in the Canton district of China, so that's why the name Angiostrongylus cantonensis. It was spread all throughout the Pacific um, by rats on ships, likely. Okay. And um, now it's pre uh, uh, rat lungworm disease cases have been reported in about 30 countries. Hawaii isn't the only place to find rat lungworm disease. And a lot of the early work, the really important early work, were conducted by, by researchers right here at UH um, Manoa. Wallace and Rosen, Alakeda, all of these guys were researchers of back in the 60s. And they were the ones that uh, actually um, linked the organism to the disease um, way back in the 60s. And the first cases were documented in the Pacific Islands. <coughs> But it's, uh, again, uh, at least 30 countries have rat lungworm disease uh, cases reported. Oops, and we have the distinction of being the epicenter for rat lungworm disease in the United States. There are rat lungworm, uh, uh, rat lungworm in Louisiana, Texas, and Florida, but there's only been one case reported on the mainland. Um, and most of the, uh, most of the effect, infections, uh, uh, a lot of people don't know how they got infected, okay? but most of the infections are soon to be due to ingestion of an intermediate host, a slower snail, on fresh produce, in smoothies, uh, salads, that sort of thing. And uh, there's a wide range of, of symptoms. It can be a very mild case, uh, or it can be flu-like symptoms, or it can be very, very serious. Uh, and what happens is the uh, worm will go through, if, if you ingest rat worm parasites, the worm goes through your intestines, uh, eventually gets into your bloodstream, and eventually in humans it goes to your central nervous system and your brain. It's, it's brain worm. And it stays there until it dies. And, and while it's, 
still alive, wiggling around in your brain, it's going to cause all sorts of neurological problems. Uh, the range of symptoms is, is very wide. Like most people have severe, I'm talking severe headaches, GI, tingling of the skin, sensitivity of the skin. Um, some people, if it causes encephalitis, meningitis, okay, inflammation of the brain, and uh, this may cause a, a death and perhaps one more patients, but there's a lot of other complications. So it can have a wide range of symptoms. It can be mild or it can be really severe and fatal. And the Department of Health reports uh, 60 cases um, in the state, but even they admit that's a very, uh, severe underestimate. Probably double or triple that. Nobody really knows. But it can be very, um, not sorry. So here's the here's the cycle. Okay, here's your rat, and rats are the definitive host. The, the parasites reproduce in the rats. They end up as adults in the heart and lungs of the rat, and then the uh, the eggs that are laid uh, move to the trachea and eventually get swallowed. And the first stage or L1 stage larva are excreted in the feces of the rat. Rat poop. Slugs and snails love to eat rat poop. And um, so the slugs and snails eat the rat poop and it goes from the first stage to the third stage in the slug or the snail. And it's that third stage that's infective to rats again. Rats love to eat slugs and snails. So that's the normal cycle, is rats and slugs and snails. And now what happens that when it's in the third stage in the, in the slug or the snail is that we're also uh, can be infected by it. So if this slug or a snail or a piece of the slug or snail or even possibly the slime of the slug or snail gets on produce and we eat that, that's generally how people think they get infected. And so these are some of the more severe cases. Silka uh, was a yogurt instructor. She was infected at the same time, totally different cases, both out of Pune. Um, she's still on a respirator at night. She was infected in 2008. This is Graham, this is Kay's son, who he nearly died, he was in a coma for uh, months, um, <coughs> and has mostly recovered. Uh, Sam was infected in, in uh, Sydney, Australia, and he's still recovering. And this is Eric from Minnesota. He was infected in Pune, and he went, he's, he's doing much better. Um, they brought him back to his hometown, and the, uh, the paper is read, Paralyzed in Paradise. <laughs> so these are some of uh, the more um, uh, severe cases, but that's mainly the life cycle. And we have lots and lots of carriers, basically, I mean, mollusk has the potential to be a carrier. The giant African snail has been here the longest, since uh, prior to uh, World War II. The Cuban slug is also a, 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 arrived in the a 1980s, and it's an, a, a, an agricultural pest as, as well. And uh, a more recent introduction to the big island, uh, Hawaii island, is the Asian semi-slug, Amarion martensi. And this slug um, has, is a very, very efficient uh, intermediate host. And this slug moves really quickly, and this slug likes to climb. It, can, it, it moves, it, it, it's very, very mobile. And um, you know, one slug can have tens of thousands of larvae in it. Okay, so depending on if you accidentally ingest a little bit of that slug or a a lot of parasites, that's what dictates how severe the symptoms are. So, um, there are other types of, of hosts, transport hosts, for example, uh, prawns, black ones. Um, they are not involved in the life cycle, but you can become infected by them. Okay? We're dead end hosts or accidental hosts. Um, and again, this is, this is ground. Uh, there's no biological development of the parasite in us. Okay? It just dies eventually after causing a lot of, of damage. Other animals are, are dead end hosts. Dogs. We've had cases of rat lung where you know, dogs, uh, horses. Um, I know uh, Lisa Woods had that uh, consultant with my man has had to euthanize three horses in the last couple of years because of rat lung So uh, any uh, so it's the it's the third stage that's so. Uh, infected to lots of other animals. Um, Rob Cowley's group, Jane Kim and Rob Cowley's group have published uh, what's the, the most comprehensive survey of, of uh, rat lung in the state. Um, 
And they tested 37 non-natives, nearly half of the non-native species of the slugs were positive. Two of the natives, uh, the seven natives that species they were positive. And surprisingly, uh, they found um, uh, positive slugs and snails pretty high up, over 1,200 meters. And of the sites that they examined, again, this is from uh, Janie uh, Rouse, uh, graduate student Janie's uh, master's thesis. Um, of the 182 sites that they found uh, testing positive, the percentage that was found on Kauai was about 34%, on Big Island, about 33%, on Maui Nui, about 18%, and on Oahu, around, around 10%. So Kauai and Hawaii have very similar uh, percentage of sites that were testing positive in their study. I don't know, is there even one case on Kauai? There might be have one case of rat lung disease on Kauai. When I was there a couple of years ago, there were none. And, so was, yeah. and Hawaii, of course, more than 90% of the cases in the state are coming from the east side, from the district of, of Hawaii. So why is that? You know, you'd expect to see more cases on Hawaii. Um, Parmaria, the, the semi-slug, has only been doc documented on Hawaii and Oahu. Still okay. okay, so so Parmaria Matensi was introduced to the Big Island in the Puna district back in 2004, and that, that slug is just spreading all over the place. It's a very, very efficient host. But is that the main reason? You know, we think to have more cases on Oahu, and I think there's only been a handful, two or three of cases on Oahu as well. So what else is going on? Catchment use on the big uh, island of Hawaii is, uh, most of the catchment in the state is in, on the big island of Hawaii. Okay. I'm not sure about catchment use on Kauai. Does anybody know? Is there a lot? I don't think there's that many. Disproportionately greater on the big island. On the big island, okay. And so, is catchment involved here? So, this is one of Trish Tucker's slides. And if you look at the percentage of households without municipal, municipal water, meaning that they're probably getting their water from catchment, okay, in the Puna district, 75% of the households do not have municipal water, and they're probably in the catchment. In Kau, that's 43%. Okay, so there's a large number of, of people that are on catchment in these areas. And some of the people, um, uh, because of our circumstances, we've become kind of the rat lung lung hotline, especially in K. When people get rat lung lung, they call us to for advice. And a lot of people have, uh, well, not a lot, some people have uh, told us the only way they think they could have gotten infected is through water. We had a case of um, uh, a, a physician at Kapilani, um treated four pediatric cases in the last couple of years. And um, all of those children, they were infants. They were never exposed to slugs. You know, they don't eat vegetables, obviously. So how did they get infected? You know, they're, all, they're all from Puna. One of them died. Uh, one of them is blind. One of them is permanently disabled, and one of them completely recovered. But catchment, this is, this is the situation where we have some systems that are in pretty good shape. I'm on catchment, I live in Hamakua. We have two 10,000 uh, gallon catchment tanks that look similar to this. You know, and we also have a 20 micron, a 5 micron filter. We have a full house UV filter. And we have our, our tanks cleaned every year. You know, so we maintain them. Some of them don't. Okay? And that could be a really big, uh, big factor. And there haven't been, um, uh, many studies in Hawaii to, to determine if, uh, if rat longworm can be transmitted in catchment water. So, about 30 to 60,000 people um, rely on catchment. And this is from Trisha's Sitar uh, uh, Manual, Puna, Kau, and Hapamakua districts. That's where they mostly are in the state. There are lots of reports of slugs and snails crawling up and into catchment tanks. I'm working with Hawaii Catchment, Rex Rito is that company. He's the one that goes out there and cleans all these tanks. And I, he's told me that he sees slugs, lots of different types of slugs, in lots of tanks all the time. Okay, especially these martensi, they can climb right up and in. You know, we just got, uh, we've been having drought conditions over the Big Island. I told them a week ago, and you'd think a drought, you'd have fewer slugs. No slugs, low water. They climb right up and go in the tanks. You know, so we've had reports of people 
Say we have all effort, you know, in the drought, we have more spills left in the tanks. And again, there haven't been a lot of studies. Chen Avakeda went to it, presented some data at a parasitology meeting, and this is just an abstract, okay? But what they showed was that that um, uh, infected lava, uh, water lava, uh, shed by the mollusks um, can contaminate water. After a day, uh, third stage larvae were observed in, in water in their studies. Increased rain uh, could, could result in mollusks drowning and, and um, larva uh, dispersing. So it's uh, theoretically possible, according to them, to be infected by drinking water. Crook et al. in uh, Thailand looked at uh, well, well water and uh, got giant African snails that were infected with uh, angio Campanensis were crawling and falling into their wells. Okay, this is a documented study. Um, the drowned whale uh, snails should third stage larvae for up to 50 hours. I think one of the more comprehensive studies was done by Richards and Merritt. These guys are out at NIH um, doing the studies in the 1960s, and they actually used Hawaii Angiostrongos Campanensis in their studies. And they looked at fresh water and seawater. And, uh, to, uh, and how different stages of the rat lungworm are affected by fresh water and seawater. And they found that L1, L1 is the one that is in rat poop. Okay. And they were able to survive three weeks in fresh water. And they were still infected with snails after two weeks in either fresh water or seawater. So seawater is what, about 3% salt. We found that at least 10%, 10 to 15% salt will kill the water. Level but not at 3% probably. They also uh, did a study to show that rats can become infected after drinking water with L3, uh, infected L3 in the, in, the, in the water, and that the L3 were active for up to a week. They took a fresh water snail and, and dropped it into a bucket of seawater, and the snail died, uh, but it yielded infected larvae for up to five days. So I haven't looked at any marine hosts as potential intermediate hosts, have, have you run? I don't know. And so we, did, we, just, we just don't know um, if there are other keratin posts out there that are, uh, or intermediate posts that are in marine uh, organisms. And they decided that they, they determined that drinking water can be contaminated by appreciable numbers of third stage larvae um, from, from digested and macerated uh, infected snails. And I'll come back to this because they specify that you have to macerate and infected snails in order to get release of the larva in the water, okay? So this is where Kay started um, a, a pilot study by asking a very simple question. Where in a column of water, oh, where in a column of water would A. cantonensis be found? Okay. And we've observed, this is, this is a, not very high tech, but it's the standard, it's Behrman technique for isolating nematodes from slugs and snails. You basically have a funnel and you connect the tube to it with a clamp on it, and we use a Kim White as a filter. You chop up your slug or your snail, you put it in a digestion solution, and then after a couple of hours, you run it through the filter. These larvae like to go down. They will go down, that's, that's what they like to do. So in this particular case, you end up with um, a, a layer of, of larva down here, and you just you plug from there with the clamp. So if they like to go down, where do they go? Where would they go in a catchment tank? And most people in catchment tank, the intake, intake pipe is at the bottom of the tank, right? So she, Kay took rainwater from her house, right off, and um, uh, brought it into the lab. We have a couple of places in Pune that we like to go and collect slugs because they're mostly infected. And so she collected uh, 10 mark pensi uh, for semi-slugs, chopped up some and kept half of them whole. And then she took five mil samples from the bottom and the middle of the top of these, uh, of these tubes. Okay, so she put the water, a few mils of water in the tube, put the slug, the slug ground, and the larva would start escaping from the, uh, from the slug. And as she took a five mil sample out, she added another five mil uh, so that you maintain a 50 mil volume over the course of the study. And we had the parallel samples with no slugs, and we checked the rainwater daily uh, and, and to determine that there were no um, that, that there were no nematodes in that rainwater. 
And then we looked at the uh, samples for the under the scope, and we have we developed a, a molecular test a couple years ago that we can use to de detect androstromal cantonethins in tissues, in slugs, snails, blood, cerebral <coughs> water. Okay, so we can use this test, which is definitive for detection of androstromal cantonethins. So overall, she had this is a total. Barbara pulled from the, the uh, 50 mil uh, falcon tubes, and she only went out to, to day five. So remember, each day she's collecting um, bottom, middle, top from 10 slugs. So the petri dishes start to, to, to accumulate pretty quickly. So she stopped in the study at day five. But what she saw was that in the first couple of days, she had very few, after you put that slug in the water and it drowns, okay, how long does it take for the larva to escape? and get, go into the water. And so she had, and for the first two days, very, very few. And then it just, it had this huge amount. And so on day three, she had over 400 larvae in her petri dish, the five mil samples that she's taking. Okay. And so she took those, those um, uh, 400 larvae and looked at it over a period of 10 days. So working in the petri dish, what's happening to those larvae over a period of of 10 days. And what she found was that most larvae originated from whole slugs, the parmarion, versus the macerated slugs, which you wouldn't expect. You know, so this means that a slug doesn't have to be macerated and to release larvae into a catchment tank. A whole parmarion, a whole semi-slug, can release lots and lots of larvae. Okay. And she looked at non-moving larvae over, over this time period versus moving larvae. Um, so the, what she saw was these non-moving larvae at the beginning, and, and it just, where were they coming from? It, it's just amazing. Uh, they, it looks like they come out of the tissue. So, so when you're taking these samples, you're taking, you're also getting some slug tissue in there. And so we think that it takes a period of time for the slug to break down to release all the larvae that's in the tissue. That's what we think is happening. And so in these early ones, they all look like this coil 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 and then they emerge from this coil coil in the water and they become a undulating um, uh, swimming larva okay so that's what she saw over time and um, so she had so the ones that are not moving here are mostly these coil coil ones and then they started to die and while well, we think they're, they're dead they no longer move in the focus and they don't do anything um, so she had so from this one sampling, she ended up having a lot of larvae <coughs> all the way up to day 10 that were alive. So they could survive in rainwater at least 10 days. So this is the where they go in the water in the water column, 92% of the larvae end up at the bottom, which we would expect. So that intake catchment intake is exactly where these larvae go. So for this little study, greater number of larvae were released from whole semi-slugs as opposed to macerated. And this could be due just to, to variance in the levels of infection. But, but obviously, the slugs don't have to be macerated in order to re release larvae in, in a tank. Okay. Greatest number of larvae came from the bottom, which we expected. Um, and the, the viable third stage larva can be released from tissue as a swimming L3, or it can be released as a, in a coiled, coiled form. Okay. Uh, and then lar larva can emerge from the coiled form and survive for at least uh, 10 days. We confirmed the infection of A. cantonensis in the, the mollusks by using this uh, quantitative or molecular test. So. so we wanted to follow up on this, and so we did another study this past summer. And she increased the number of species of mollusks that she was looking at and increased the study time to 20 days. So African snail, this is a leatherback slug. These are the ones that get really big. Okay. Uh, cub uh, cubensis slug, again, uh, uh, semi-slug. Okay. And this is a flatworm. Okay. Um, flatworms are not intermediate hosts. They're peritonic hosts. They can, uh, they, they, they can transmit to us. And these guys, if you even touch them, they'd start to fall apart and disintegrate. If you had one of these or even a part of one in your salad, you'd not be able to tell it from a mushroom, a piece of mushroom or something like that. 
So her, uh, again, the same type of, of, of approach, rainwater is collected, and this time we, we check the rainwater every day, the parallel study of the rainwater every day to make sure there's no nematodes in there. We even did qPCR to, to verify that there were no uh, rat lungworm in the, that rainwater uh, sample, sampling she was using. So I had 12 mollusks and one flatworm, again, put in tubes with 50 mils of water. They had parallel no slug tubes. Okay, again, half was left whole, half was macerated. And um, we used qPCR to, to establish a foot infection in, in the mollusks. And so with these samples, she did, um, after about 14 hours when a mollusk appeared dead in the, in the tube, uh, she started taking samples from the bottom, middle, and top. Okay, and she followed this one out for the entire 20 days. And so again, location uh, at the bottom, most of them. Um, the results, uh, so these are the individual, uh, these are all giant African snails, leatherbacks, Cuban slugs, flatworm, and then these are semi-slugs. And this is just showing us which ones, uh, where they were all from, most of them were from, these are both uh, uh, areas in Lower Puna. Um, for each one she had a hole and a macerated hole and a macerated, so we them there. And, and overall, six of the 12 specimens were, were fairly positive. What we found here, though, that the tails of QPCR didn't always match, um, didn't always match, uh, this was negative, but those are low positives okay, by the visual um, uh, counting in the cookie dish. But anyway, uh, we had six of the 12 yielded very low amounts, and interestingly, um, the masqueraded leatherback yielded high positive numbers of larva, both QPCR and visually. And in the, uh, in the semi slugs, it was the whole ones, again, the whole ones that were high positive. I don't know if this is just a sampling thing with a the very small sample numbers, you know, but that's kind of an interesting observation. So, Leatherbacks might require maceration more so than, than um, semi-slugs in order to release large numbers of water and a large numbers of larva and water. And so it's what she did, but a lot of the samples from the 50 mil tubes, a lot of the, the lar larva were um, released the first and second day, which is different from what we saw in the other study. Um, and what we see here, here is that here's the uh, semi-slug, the number of larva released okay, from samples. So she took samples on day one, put them in petri dishes, and followed them out for 20 days. Okay. And so the, the obvious thing here is that the semi-slug, initially they both had very low for the first couple of days, and the semi-slug shot up to almost 900 larva um, in that petri dish. Where did they come from? Probably tissue is dissolving and they're released from the tissue. And then it drops right back down. And then the uh, leatherback, again, its peak was, again, over 100, 900, um, but that was not until about day seven, so it took longer for the massive amounts of larva to be released from the leatherback than from the um, semi-slug. Um, and I walked in the lab one day, and Kay, there was Kay at the microscope, red-eyed and going, I don't know what these are. <laughs> so, so I want to just quickly show you what she was looking at under the scope, if I can. Okay, so these guys, I'm not a nematologist, Kay is not a nematologist. So we called in a nematologist at the USDA, uh, Roxanne Myers. She came down and looked at him and said, she thinks, she thinks this one is a bacteria feeding one. This is, is way too big to be an uh, angiostrongulus. Okay? But all these other little guys are not. They're all in the range. Remember in a slug, you can have L1, L2, and L3 stage. Okay? And those have slightly different sizes. So what Kay was looking at underneath the scope is basically this going, what are these? And so we called